All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is a great audience. Um, my name is Kevin Curran. I will be speaking for the next hour about gene therapies. I am uh, with an organization called Biotech Primer. We do educational talks, live educational talks for a broad audience. Um, generally, there's no PhDs in the audience, so if there's a few PhDs in here today, that's fine. Um, this might be you know, maybe some repeated information, but we intend to hit a broad audience. Most of the industry is actually non-PhDs and folks that benefit from nice overviews of some new drug categories. So I'm gonna talk about gene therapy and I'm gonna mostly focus on the science, the biology, um, but I'll sort of pepper in some industry anecdotes and, and kind of orient us with where we're at in the, in the, uh, the the, the landscape right now with gene therapy approvals. So here we go. This is myself. Um, I'm a research biologist. I focused on stem cell biology um, through most of my um, research work and doctorate. Um, I've been teaching at University of San Diego. So this is my hometown. I grew up here. So it's, it's great to be at the convention center. Um, seven years ago, I transitioned into teaching uh, for the industry and also consulting. Um, I've worked with Biogen for their spinal muscular atrophy program, Sarepta with their Duchenne program. I'm currently uh, consulting for Bristol Myers, so I'm involved with CAR T cell therapy, which is the most successful example of an ex vivo gene therapy. Um, and they're going after non Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, multiple myeloma. Um, so the company Biotech Primer, we do these, you know, overview courses, biotech for non-scientists, and then we also have focus talks, drug manufacturing, drug development, FDA regulatory overviews. Um, we've got a booth um, over in the 5,000s, over uh, 5438, so come on by. We've got free books, free uh, kind of Bio 101 books talking about cell therapy and gene therapy that kind of reiterates what I'll talk about today. Um, we partner with Bio, which is happening right now, and um, I also teach classes with these other West Coast organizations, um, CLS, Life Science Washington up in Seattle, and Biocom. So normally this course is really interactive and we have kind of wide-ranging um, questions and, and whatnot. With this type of a, a setting, I'm just going to talk through, and I've got a timer right here, so I will stop at least um, 10 minutes before um, the hour, um, so we have time for Q&A. Um, but I'll ask you to hold your questions till then. Okay, let's do this. So, of, of gene therapy. Um, I feel like I kind of hit these points already. Um, I think everyone's clear with uh, the, the rest of the cell biology here. So I mentioned, you know, there's 7,000 genetic disorders. Some of those are better characterized than others. We've got these monogenetic diseases, so where there's one gene that causes the disease. So these are the ones you hear the most about, and, and they're the ones where there's the most competition right now to get an approved gene therapy. So there's a lot of companies going after sickle cell anemia. This is just one base letter change. In the hemophilia gene, you have, uh, there's, there's an adenine to thymine switch, so it's a single letter change, and that is sufficient to create such a poorly formed uh, hemoglobin protein that it crashes out the whole red blood cell to the point where the, sick, the, the red blood cell looks like a sickle cell, and it, and, and it, it screws up the whole circulatory system. Um, the cystic fibrosis, Huntington's, other examples where we know there's, there's one dominant gene that's causing the issue. Um, and then, of course, we have some of the big killers here in the U.S., cancer, cardiovascular, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. These are polygenic. So these are tougher nuts to crack in general because there's more than one gene that's driving the disorder forward. So it's not as simple as thinking about packaging a, a a therapeutic gene into a, an AAV viral vector or a 
lipid nanoparticle and punching it into the right cell. Um, you need to think about a collection of genes, and as you can imagine, the, as more moving parts sort of increase, the efficiencies go down. So these are, these are tougher diseases in terms of uh, fixing them w by, by bringing in a, 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 like a compensation gene. Um, so like I said, you, you see the most aggressive competition right now for these monogenic disorders. Um, so before I go any further, I just I want to set gene therapy in the context of, of really the, the deep history of drugs. You know, we're now at a place um, with medicine where we can design drugs that can engage at each of these levels of cell biology, DNA to RNA to protein to, to the whole cell, right? So, you know, what I've done here at the bottom is, is sort of map out all these broad categories of drugs and show that, you know, we, we do now have two FDA-approved drugs on the market that, that fix a problem at the genetic level. We've got gene editing, which is arguably a more precise way to, to fix a gene. We've got a handful of companies moving that through clinical trials. We've got drugs that engage at the RNA level. Um, you know, um, alnylam has, has, has put a few drugs on the market. Uh, Biogen, who I mentioned, has a, a, an RNA drug uh, to go after spinal muscular atrophy. And then the big kind of star of the show for the last couple decades has been monoclonal antibody drugs. Those are protein drugs that engage with other proteins, often receptor proteins on the surface of our cell. And then we've got these cell therapies now, you know, even going back to just stem cell uh, bone marrow transplants, that's a cell therapy. So we've got ways to engage on the cellular level as well. So we've never had more tools in the toolbox. Um, but, you know, each of these categories has their own challenges. Like I mentioned, we, you know, scientists have been going, you know, aggressively uh, uh, towards gene therapy with viral vectors for, you know, about 50 years and we have two drugs on the market. So it's been slow and steady progress with, with lots of challenge, um, but you know, it, it does look like we've never been in a better position to, to make advances, and I'm hoping to see a, 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 a wave of new approvals in the next couple of years. We're certainly poised um, to see that. Okay, so when we think about gene therapy, I think the cleanest way to categorize gene therapies is through in vivo and ex vivo. Um, in vivo gene therapy is, is sort of the most intuitive approach. It's what probably comes to your mind with gene therapy where we are going to package a therapeutic gene into a viral vector and then inject the viral vector into the patient's body. Now, like I said, delivery is one of the big challenges. Ever since, you know, biologists started playing around with viruses in a lab, it became apparent to them, and they started publishing about this, that they could, um, they could manipulate the viral genome um, and use the virus to dock up on cells and to cross the membrane and then cross the nuclear membrane and deliver a therapeutic gene um, either into the chromosomes directly or on a little extra chromosome uh, region that we call an episome. But either way, the cell would then start producing pro the, the viral proteins in the cells. And in this case, it would be the therapeutic protein. So this has been the route um, taken by Novartis. Um, you know, they bought out Avexis and they have a uh, a, an in vivo delivery system with Zolgensma for spinal muscular atrophy. And they inject directly into the patient's blood, little kids. Um, and that is sufficient. The AV, they use AV9, it will dock up on the motor neurons in the, in the spine and, and punch the therapeutic protein um, into the motor neurons, and then they s start producing SMN protein, and the motor neurons remain healthy. They don't die off any further. And so the kids maintain 
you know, muscular c control to some degree. It's not perfect, but it, it does work. Uh, and then we saw, you know, Spark do this with, um, in the eye. They got Lux Turner approved. That was an ocular injection. So this is another key piece, which I'll hit on again, is the route of administration. You can either go systemic into the blood, or you can go with a localized injection if that's the best way to hit your cellular targets. Um, the eye is, 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 uh, is nice because it's separate from the immune system, and I'll talk about why that's a value. Um, so that's a real quick nutshell on in, in vivo delivery. Um, and there's a lot of steps involved with manufacturing AEV virus um, that is ready to go at the right dose to be injected into the patient. That's been a big challenge. And there's some talks this morning about um, you know, how, to kinda, how to help out the manufacturing system to make sure we have enough viral vector um, to, to, to satisfy the industry um, and the patients. So that's in vivo. Now there's this other category, which is ex vivo. And this is you know, outside of life. This is outside of the human body. And this has proven to be incredibly effective. Um, it's really a form of cell therapy. It's a, it's a form of cell therapy that involves genetic manipulation. That's the way to think about ex vivo cell therapy. And it's the way to think about CAR T as a treatment for cancer patients. Um, CAR-T is arguably the most successful version of ex vivo gene therapy. So what does this look like? Um, you remove a cell population from the body, okay? Now, as you, this is most readily done with blood cells and immune cells. Anything that's circulating in liquid is going to be a good candidate to take out of the body and then keep surviving in a lab environment for a few weeks while you genetically manipulate them and then be in a, in a, you're in a position where you can reinfuse them back into the patient's body. And they're now like super. Step is most, this, this step is most commonly done with lentivirus. It's another type of virus, and I'm gonna explain why that's become kind of the industry standard. It's more optimal for these ex vivo approaches. Um, you, this is done in a lab environment, so you get some benefits here in terms of watching the process happen. You can do a little bit of, you know, observation and sort of quality control before the cells are then infused back into the patient's body. So like I said, I work in the CAR-T industry. This is done in about three weeks. And, and Kite Pharma, owned now by Gilead, they do this really well, I will say that. Um, they, in terms of the speed with which they manufacture and, and the success rate, that's, 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 um, they, 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 they've, they've done as, uh, they've done a great job. Um, and their drug is called Yescarta. It's approved for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's, it's really, I think, the most successful ex vivo drug in terms of patients treated and, um, Yeah. Um, so, there's a lot of hospital steps involved here. So this is quite intensive. Um, it's, you know, the drugs are expensive, right? You, you, it, it needs to be mentioned. This is about 500K for a single injection. Every product differs a little bit. But there's at least 500K in hospital costs associated with this. The patients coming in and out, there, there's, a, there's a lymphodepleting uh, chemotherapy step. They're in and out of the apheresis clinic to pull blood. Um, they're coming back in for their infusion. Sometimes the adverse events keep them at the hospital for a week or 10 days. Sometimes in the um, ICU, in the worst case, dealing with um, you know, side effects, neurotox, cytokine release syndrome. Um, that part's getting better, and physicians are getting, becoming more proficient with how to mitigate that, um, so that's good. Um, but either way, it's, you know, it can go over a million total in cost. So you know, this is me sort of editorializing, but this 
ultimately has more scalability to it, just more inherently, if you can just do a single injection as people show up. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, the, another big challenge with this approach is these, this works best for cells that can be removed from the human body. So there's going to be a lot of cells, the, your target cells, that are not good candidates um, for this. If you think in terms of, you know, uh, like a glioblastoma, if you want to address uh, central nervous system cancer, something like that. Um, we, we're seeing it work really well for bone marrow cells um, and, and, and immune cells. Um, so uh, companies are, are going to try to be really innovative to see what other cell types they can go after in an ex vivo way. And you're seeing a lot of companies that are going to try to shift this to what's called an allogenic approach or off the shelf, where you're not customizing every population to the patient. You're creating um, uh, you know, uh, cells that can be used for uh, multiple patients. And, and, and without triggering immune rejection. That's one of the big challenges. Allogene's an example of a company going after that. All right. So to further delineate between these two, we're talking about ex vivo and in vivo. Ex vivo, CAR-T is the example. I mentioned it's often performed with lentiviruses. Um, lentivirus directly injects the gene into the chromosomes. That's one of the key differences between AAV viruses. AAVs, for the most part, remain out off the chromosomes. So what does that mean? The ex vivo is good for cells that rapidly divide, because with each downstream cell, um, the, you know, the replication will pass that, the therapeutic gene on to the, the daughter cells, um, whereas that could be diluted out with an AV approach. If, you, if you're not punching into the chromosomes, um, that therapeutic gene could, can be diluted out with, with lots of subsequent cell divisions. That's a big consideration. Um, we're not tied to the viral vector approach. It's just what we're doing now. And it's what's working commercially. I, I mentioned, you know, in, ter in terms of the FDA, we've got two... Um, a AAV in vivo drugs approved. We've got six CAR T's approved, six ex vivos approved, approved in the US. Um, and a lot of those have come recently in the last few years. We, now we have Carvicti for multiple myeloma from Janssen, and then we have uh, Abecma as well for multiple myeloma from BMS. Um, those just happened recently. So, um, Everyone's using some a lentivirus or something similar to lentivirus. It's possible that there's a non-viral approach that would work better. This is, you know, the next 10 years should bear this out. Lipid nanoparticles are now being pursued. And then there's also, you know, mechanical ways to pop genes into cells, electroporation and otherwise. So that's something to keep in mind. We're certainly not um, attached at the hip to viral vectors. As, as many of you folks know, it's incredibly expensive to manufacture sufficient viral vectors. And, you know, the FDA and these, these companies are still sort of ironing out the details in terms of best practices and whatnot. So um, there's a lot of room for improvement, but they certainly work um, at this point. So these are a few other characteristics to think about. Really, when you're thinking about any vector, any delivery system that can help you reach a target gene with a, thera a, a target cell with a therapeutic gene, um, you know, you want to think safety profile. The reason we've the industry is focused on these these two is because they are non-pathogenic. We've we've sort of taken the uh, we've modified them so that. Um, that they, you know, they don't cause problematic, you know, side effects. Um, AAV is, you know, compared to other viral vectors, it has very low immune issues, so low, low, low immuno, immunogenicity. Um, but that said, it's, it's, it's not, we're not at zero there. Um, they both target dividing and non-dividing cells, that's good. 
um, and that's why they're both in favor. I mentioned that lentivirus will directly insert the therapeutic gene into the chromosome. Um, while that's good because it doesn't dilute out the, the, the protein levels over time, um, there's a risk of causing a mutation. There's a risk that it might land in one of your good genes. So we call that insertional mutagenesis. And you can see if anyone's tracking Bluebird Bio right now, they just had an ad com uh, just within the week. And that was a big piece that was being looked at by the FDA is where, where are their therapeutic genes landing? What gene are they disrupting? And then is that in itself causing a cancer or some kind of a problem? So that's, that is a going concern. But overall, it does seem to be safe. Um, you know, so, so, you know, the industry is certainly moving forward that one of the biggest constraints with AAV is it has a small packaging capacity because of the nature of the genome of AAV. It can only hold really about 4,000, 4.4 thousand base pairs of DNA. So a lot of genes are too large to fit um, inside the genome of AAV. So if you look at the field of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you've got Pfizer and uh, Sarepta and solid bioscience trying to package this enormous gene, dystrophin, into an AAV vector to get it into the muscle cells so the, the, the muscle cells work. Well, they're, they each, they, each of those companies has to come up with their own strategy to fit this enormous gene into the AAV. So they're truncating the gene in various ways. So already you're, you're sort of, that's less than ideal. Um, so that, that's another constraint uh, with AAV. So I already touched on this, but administration is a big part of the strategy of a gene therapy company. They'll be thinking about this early on. Um, you know, they'll be thinking about what's their target cell, what's the delivery system they're going to use, Will, what will the specificity be of their delivery system? Will the, will the vector or the lipid nanoparticle have good binding um, affinity to the cell that they're going after? And then how can that be complemented with the method of delivery? So, you know, you can think in, in two general ways. You've got systemic delivery, which is basically into the bloodstream, where it's, it's going to circulate and, and hopefully hit your target cell at the right uh, right volume. Um, and then you've got localized delivery. So if you pump a, a gene therapy into the blood, you're going to obviously have great access to blood cells. Um, and you're also going to have great access to kidney and liver because that's the blood's going to circulate through there. So you'll, you'll end up with, you know, viral vector in close proximity to those cells. And, and that's why you see a lot of these kind of frontline early companies going after genetic disorders um, of, you know, liver and kidney. BioMarin is trying to get their hemophilia A drug approved right now. Um, and, and so they're targeting liver cells with an AV. Uh, I mentioned Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is another competitive field for gene therapy. So you can do an intramuscular injection to target muscle cells. Um, bone marrow cells can be removed from the body and genetically modified in an ex vivo way and then injected back in. And we just saw data yesterday from CRISPR Therapeutics that showed um, they're making headway. They've got good data um, with, with sickle cell and beta thalassemia um, where they are manipulating he fetal hemoglobin levels um, in bone marrow cells um, to, to, to raise the level of hemoglobin. So that seems to be working. Um, and then I mentioned Luxterna. Uh, they're doing an, an ocular injection, right, to hit the, the retinal cells. Um, you've got a, like a nice contained space in here, so you get your dosage right, and you can, you can hit these, you know, the, the retinal epithelial cells at, at the right level and, and, and punch a gene across to try to help these folks have better vision. Um, so different ways um, to administer. 
Um, this is just sort of a cellular, uh, you know, a little bit higher magnification. But, you know, as I'll mention, within the AAV uh, family of viruses, we have a wide selection of what we call serotypes um, that, that differ in a lot of their surface markers. And that allows them to have different levels of specificity to certain target cells in our body. So AAV9 um, binds well to, uh, to neurons. Um, and that's the, the key step because that allows the cell will, inter the virus will internalize into the cell, sort of it'll form an endosome pocket will be formed around it. And, it, and it's then can cross the nuclear membrane and the, 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 the viral genome will pop out. In the case of a lentivirus, it'll then integrate into the chromosome. So, you know, this is what viruses do. This is how they've evolved. This is how they propagate their genetics. And so we've, we're just co-opting that machinery um, for our own purposes here, which is therapies, right? Um, and co-opt is, is a versatile wor word in this context because the, the strategy these viruses use is they co-opt the cellular machinery of the cells that they infect. So I mentioned, uh, you know, viruses are sort of, I, I think of them as, you know, it's the most sort of crass, raw form of evolution. It's, they're just code. It's just genetic code with the lightest amount of packaging around them. And, and they're just trying to propagate their own genetics into the future at, by parasitizing hosts, right? So they don't, they don't carry a big suitcase. They carry just a handful of genes. And then they rely on a lot of the transcriptional, translational machinery of the cells they infect to carry out the, re the rest of their plan, which is to, to massively produce and create viral replicants in these cells. So um, as I'm going to touch on, of course, that replication component had to be disabled b before this would be a safe and viable approach. And so the, 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 the genes that an AAV does carry, which are, we call rep and cap genes, they have been removed from the virus and, and put on an, an adjacent uh, plasmid that's, that's necessary for manufacturing. But the AAV has lost its capacity to replicate when it's used in a therapeutic context. That's worth mentioning. All right, so I already started touching on uh, you know, viral vector characteristics. Um, I've talked about Lenti versus AV. It's also worth mentioning promoters. Um, that's also part of the strategy when a company thinks about how to deliver the therapeutic gene to the right cell, it's, they need to punch, they need to dock up the virus on the surface of the cell, but they, once the, the therapeutic uh, gene is inside the cell, you want to make sure that it's actually going to be expressed, right? The gene has to be turned on so that it, cr it transcribes to RNA and then translates to protein. That's what really matters is getting sufficient levels of the therapeutic protein in those cells. So we can use little regulatory pieces of DNA called promoters that are often cell-specific. So that will be part of the, the, the construct, the, the, the therapeutic gene with a little piece of upstream regulatory DNA that will drive expression in the target cells. Um, this is going to be really scrutinized moving forward because when, when you think about gene therapy, you're hoping for a one-and-done approach. That's the dream, right? A curative treatment. That means that you need, to be, you need to now be consistently producing sufficient levels of therapeutic protein for a decade, maybe two decades, maybe the whole lifetime, right? Um, and so that promoter is going gonna, is gonna to be a, a, a big factor in sort of optimally driving the gene expression so that it doesn't shut off, right? That, that would be a problem if the gene is in place, but it, it's, tr it's transcriptionally repressed, okay? And so, you know, and, and the honest truth is we're still sort of sorting out a lot of these details where, you know, I don't know, maybe we're 10 years into Zolgensma data. If you go back to 
early clinical trials. I, I'm not sure if that's the exact number, but we obviously don't have two decades of clinical data to ask about durability, right? And I'm going to show, well, I'll get to it in a second. Um, yeah, so I've already mentioned delivery route. Um, intrathecal is a lumbar punch into the cerebral spinal fluid. Very invasive. So again, thinking about scalability, how are we going to reach big numbers of patients? Um, we need to think you know, about, you know, obviously, an intrathecal administration is going to be really tough. You need a team of neurosurgeons right, using tracing dyes and whatnot to sort of dodge the, the, the spine and, and get, get the, the vector in place. So big consideration when you try to think about hitting big numbers of peoples with this approach. Um, this just gives you a feel for um, the, the variety of AEV that exists. AEV is naturally occurring, so these are, these are variants or serotypes of AEV that have been found in the human body or found in chimpanzees. Um, and we, what you know, scientists have found is that depending on the version of the viral vector, they have uh, you know, higher or lower affinities for some of these, these different cells. And the, the binding and affinity is driven by the, you know, a, a, really a whole bunch of molecules on the surface of the AEV vector. V, VP3 is one of the capsid proteins that's important in determining binding and affinity. I'm not going to go into too much detail about AV manufacturing process because it gets down into the weeds really fast. Um, and it's, it's inherently complicated, which is one of the problems with AV manufacturing is there's so many moving parts. Um, there's multiple plasmids to create an AV viral vector with a therapeutic gene um, ready to go, filled and finish, um, is incredibly complex. You need to, you, it's often done in hex cells. So you're pumping some genetic material on often three separate plasmids and you are transfecting those into hex cells, which is human embryonic kidney cells in culture. And then the vi th those genes will express into viral proteins and the AV will form in the context of these cultured cells. And then they have to be, those cells are cracked open and you purify out the viral vector. Um, and that does not happen perfectly. It does not happen with 100% efficiency. So there's a lot of impurities that have to be removed. And, I, and the industry is not completely clear on what are the key you know, metrics. You'll hear a lot of conversation right now about empty, cas caspid, ugh, empty uh, capsids, which just means it's a viral vector that formed, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have the full set of, of, of genes in it that it needs to. And it, we're still figuring out how that how that affects efficiency and safety in a, in a therapeutic context. That's just one piece that the FDA are sort of, you know, working with companies to kind of gain ground on. But, you know, in broad strokes, we, like I said, this is a, just a little schematic of the viral, um, you know, genome. And the, this is the replication and capsid proteins that are removed rendering the AV virus incapable of replicating. And then we can pop in what, the transgene, which is the therapeutic gene that will go in place. And then everything between, between these ITRs, which are inverted, um, inverted terminal repeats, that's what will actually be read out. OK, that's plenty of detail there. We just show this to show what uh, Novartis is using for Zolgensma. They've, you know, in terms of in vivo, they've treated, um, yeah, quite a few spinal muscular atrophy patients at this point. Um, and this is the gene that's missing in those kids, those young kids that are born without sufficient SMN uh, protein in their motor neurons. And so, like I said, their motor neurons deteriorate, and then the kids lose con full control of their muscle and body. And, and if they have type 1 SMA, they perish at a very young age. So the, the, the objective is to take that SMN gene, 
um, package it inside the ITR. They came up with their, this is their promoter. These are their regulatory pieces of DNA that will drive SMN expression. And it's, you know, from what I've seen, it's, it's, it is working their, their, um, to, to, to produce SMN protein. Um, like I said, the, the durability piece and how many years will it can keep expressing is always going to be a question, and we're just going to learn as we go along. Um, I've sort of touched on this. Um, when you think about your target cell, you will be curious how, how quickly that cell is dividing. Some cells in our body really don't divide much at all from the point where we're born, where we, you know, once we develop. Um, motor neurons are sort of like that. They, we, they, we, our motor neurons establish in our cerebro, in our spine, and um, they, don't, they don't go through much cell division. So that makes them an ideal target. Um, because you don't have to worry about diluting out the therapeutic gene. Um, if you go, if you're trying to hit a genetic disorder in a rapidly dividing cell, um, that might not be a great candidate for AAV. And, you know, relevant to that topic is the idea of redosing, right? So, um, you know, like I said, the dream the, is to be one and done, and to, to have this be sufficient um, to, to keep the therapeutic protein high. Well, what if it's not? What if after six or seven years, the therapeutic proteins drop below baseline and symptoms start coming back? You'd like to be able to redose, maybe at no additional cost to the patient or the insurers, right? That would be, that seems fair. The challenge there is that once you've been in, in once you've been treated with an AV viral vector, your body has now had a chance to create immune memory against it, the same way we would hope our body would create immune memory against um, a, a coronavirus infection, you know, or any viral infection. It's the same, same situation. Um, our B cells will generate antibodies against that virus because they recognize it as non-self. Um, and so what this means is that um, it's, we're not clear exactly how well it would work to do a redose maybe five years later. That's the, the honest truth. We're not exactly clear what that would look like. Um, and the other piece, which is worth mentioning, is some people that have never received a gene therapy, um, there's some percent of, you know, of, of this room that already has antibodies against AAV because AAV has already passed through your body. You just, it didn't make you sick, but you actually have immune memory against it. So it has to be determined. Those people have to be screened out. When you look at clinical trials and exclusion criteria for AVs, um, th that's going to be a, um, a concern is, is do you have antibodies against AEV already? If not, you're not a good candidate for the, the treatment. So that's going to change depending on the AAV. Um, I believe the number with, with Zolgensma, I, th I think it was somewhere around 10 to 20% of the population already had antibodies against AV9, and so they were not candidates for the drug. So it's a consideration. Again, we're not wedded to the idea of viral vectors. If someone comes up with a better system for delivering genes to target cells um, that doesn't, doesn't kind of generate immune response like this, that would be great. All right, we're doing well on time. We've got um, 17 minutes left. I'm going to aim to end in about seven minutes, and then I can open it up to questions. So I've been touching on this durability. How long does the gene remain active? Um, you know, a lot of factors are at play. I mentioned the promoter, the regulatory region. Um, that helps drive gene expression. Um, the other piece is going to be what's the optimal dose, right? You, you, you want to dose high enough that you're hitting enough target cells that then get that therapeutic gene, but you don't want to dose with too many vector genomes where you trigger toxicity. And also, these vector genomes are incredibly expensive, right, especially now. They should come. They they will come down in cost, um, but getting dose right and the genetic regulatory elements 
um, thinking in terms of how quickly those cells naturally turn over in your body, these are all gonna contribute to some amount of duration where the gene therapy works. Now, I've, a, a lot of folks in gene therapy have been following hemophilia. Uh, Biomarin has a drug called Roctavian, and the FDA keeps asking them for more, more years of data. They're not quite giving them the thumbs up, so this drug's not on the market. But, you know, the, the goal here with this drug is to punch in, to, 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 to insert the clotting factor that hemophiliacs need that prevents their blood from coagulating, right? They're missing clotting factor eight. It's an enzyme. And so the strategy is to use an AV vector to insert clotting factor eight into uh, liver cells, and you will then um, see the clotting factor increase over a baseline. So this is their, I think this is their three-year data right here. I, I grabbed this because it tells the story pretty well. Here's baseline if you're a hemophiliac. Now, after the gene therapy, you see this increase, maybe peaking out at 37 to 40 weeks after an, um, administration. This is, you know, that's the bio, the biomarker is factor eight. It's also one of their clinical endpoints. It's what's being scrutinized, and it absolutely correlates with bleeding events, which is what the patient cares about, right? And so you do get a, a, a huge reduction in bleeding events per year once, once you get this bump in this clotting factor protein, right? Now, what we're all tracking is whether this is a slow drop-off or a plateau. And that's, that really gets to the heart of this durability question, right? So we're now at, I think we're, they've now released maybe five years of data, um, somewhere around that. And, and, and uh, there's, it's still not clear exactly how stable it is um, and, 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 and really what, what does the FDA want to see here, honestly? That's part of it. And, and, then, and what's the correlation with bleeding events? Um, you can see these are big error bars, so you get variation per patient. Um, anyway, I just use this as an example just to visualize what durability looks like. It's, you know, do we settle at a, at a, at a baseline that, that makes the patient's lives better, or after six or seven years, does it dip below that baseline and their bleeding events start coming up? It's an important question for the patients. It's also important for reimbursement, because these drugs, Zolgensmo's, Cost 2.1 million for a single injection. The, you're, these companies are going over 1 million for the, you know, at least for for, for these on the market. Um, that and and we're not getting into you know you know cost and whatnot, but uh, it certainly matters when you think about durability. It's it's an important factor when you think about how many years of durability you're going to get. Um, so obviously, as a fan of gene therapy. I, 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 I hope to see that this stabilizes and then and you get a really long durable um, effect uh, with, with this treatment. Um, all right, so I've really touched on each of these issues. You know, I, I've been highlighting the risks and challenges, uh, mostly clinically and scientifically throughout this, the last hour. Um, Hitting the right target cell is important. Delivery, I talked about immunogenicity. It's how likely will the, the vector uh, generate an antibody issue, and then how can that be mitigated? Those are all concerns. Um, and, you know, like all therapies, there are safety risks. These are, you know, a few. We know I mentioned dose-limiting toxicities. Um, you can see liver damage when you start hitting a certain level. Um, we can track that with some liver enzymes. Um, um, I've also seen uh, the, the dorsal root ganglia neurons seem to, are, are damaged by some AEV um, gene therapies. So these are items that, that need to be you know, heavily scrutinized uh, moving forward. Um, and then we can track these patients after clinical trials um, with patient registries, and, and that's really this long-term follow-up that you need. 
to track durability and also safety issues. Eventually, we'll start. We'll gain some information about redosing and whether that's that's possible. But um, you know, we'll be you know tracking patients on a long time frame. Um, you know, I began this talk by mentioning that there's about 7,000 genetic disorders, right? There's about 10,000 human diseases, according to, you know, World Health Organization. 7,000 of those are tracked to, you know, genetic issues. So, but the reality is the, 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 the funding and, and the, the focus of pharmaceutical companies are not broadly spread across all 7,000 of these. In fact, there's, there's really a small handful of genetic disorders that are, are drawing a lot of the attention. And it's because they satisfy all of these key criteria for what makes sense clinically and commercially, right? So, um, you know, w clear biomarkers, certain number of prevalence, the existence of disease foundations, um, you know, um, IP environment, whatnot. Um, but what that's, I think that's great on the front end, but in the long term, you know, we're, we're going to want to move off of these, these small handful of genetic disorders. Um, and, and at some point, it, it becomes a, a, a problem for multiple companies to go after them because we're going to have so many um, approved drugs for just a small number so that the market compensation is going to be really intense. But fortunately, with new viral vectors, new vectors outside of viruses, cell targeting, there's a lot of new kind of biotech, new approaches that are being explored where, you know, you know I'm being optimistic here in the next decade, um, we'll be able to make headway on, on a much broader range of these genetic disorders. Okay. Final slide, and then I'll shut up and take some questions. I like this slide. It's a, it's a paper from 2019. They were trying to be predictive about where you would see um, FDA approvals for cell and gene therapies. You can see by 2030, these are cumulative numbers, they were pegging it at, at the blood cancers. Heme cancers would see the most approvals. Um, and then you can see um, hematology has a, a big number here. Um, a lot of these are because these target cell environments, these tissues are, are, the, are being pursued by the most companies because because of the way you can go after these target cells. Their number for 2022, I just looked at this this morning, they're not wrong. We have now six CAR-T drugs on the market in 2022. So, you know, they're just looking at the bulk of companies coming up in clinical trials and the success rate for, for different indications. But, um, you know, the next decade will be exciting, right? Um, so that's it. I'm kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm an educator, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big optimist um, for cell and gene therapies. So I will end it there, and um, I will mention that our teaching company, Biotech Primer, we've got a booth on the far side, 5428, and if you want, we have books for free um, that. Um, go through the background science of a lot of drug modalities. I just talked about gene therapy, um, but you can grab uh, one of these books for free. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. I'm fine if people want to yell out any questions, or they can, I think you can step up to the mic, but please. Yeah, great question. Right now, most we're going off these naturally existing serotypes with their, their VP3 proteins and some glycans and sugar molecules. There's a lot of biotech companies that are manipulating, intentionally manipulating the surface receptors to try to have high affinity um, for, for cell types. There's, you know, I mentioned alnylam, alnylam. They've had great success with, uh, with lipid nanoparticles and going after specific cell receptors on hepatocyte cells. So it can absolutely be improved with direct manipulation. Yeah. Hi. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, even with uh, AAV therapy, uh, the cells are gonna have to be replenished by the normal process of the body. Even if you're talking about a cell that is not dividing, like in the liver, at some point they're gonna just disappear or die. Uh, so why would you not propose a lentiviral therapy with a gene that gets integrated, incorporated, and then uh, it just doesn't fade out? And you have injections and the problems that you mentioned. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Why not go lentiviral and integrate into the chromosome? It, it's, because, it's because of the concerns of mutagenesis. And, and that's why I mentioned that the Bluebird Bio Adcom is, is really scrutinizing that. Um, it appears to be relatively safe, but nobody wants to, nobody wants to overstate that. Nobody wants to be too dismissive um, of the lentiviral approach. Um, and, and so there's just a lot of hesitancy there. But if you could, if you could use a vector to directly insert into chromosomes in a directed way that would have a guarantee of not disrupting a healthy gene, that would be certainly exciting. They, when, when Bluebird looked at some, their data and they dug into the genetics of some of their treated patients, they did see that they had inserted right in the middle of a gene called VAMP4. And they, they, you know, they made the argument that that didn't cause any health concerns, but still, patients, if you can imagine, if, if someone says it might land in the middle of one of your genes, and we've seen it, is, it does, I think that's, that's a big point of friction. Yeah. Please. You know, I think the honest answer is that I cannot give you a great answer there. Um, there's probably, I'm sure there's people in the room that, that, that could. I think, um, I, well, it's, everything's expensive. Now you've got, you know, supply chain issues. There's, so I can point to two points in, in AV vector manufacturing that are expensive. They, they need high-grade CGMP plasmids really high quality plasmids to do their, their triple transfections into the hex cells. That in itself ha it has its own shortages. So their raw materials e have their own shortages, e even though we th the, the drug companies think of the viral vector as the, the raw material they're waiting on. Um, good, trans good, good plasmids are expensive. And then also the downstream step, which is once they crack open the hex cells and then run it through column chromatography, and try to filter out all the impurities, th that in itself is incredibly expensive. Um, then you, you, know, you can add on the factor of good personnel are, are hard to find right now. These, these are people that are highly proficient at viral vector manufacturing, you know, and, and there's, there's only so many of them. And, and then, you know, everybody's trying to expand their manufacturing footprint. All the big pharma companies are, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to play this right where they're going to they're going to they're going to outsource some of it so, to CMOs, contract manufacturing organizations, and then they're going to build where they need to or they should on their own and, and build out their facility. So people are trying to go a hybrid approach to sort of buffer um, these bits here. But uh, good people are in are in short supply. And and, you know, the, everything is has to be high CGMP standard. And so none of that's cheap. I just read, I think, stat news throughout this number, and, and so, you know, you, you won't usually see a drug company mention their cost of manufacturing, um, but since this, they, they threw out the number, think in the terms of range of 50 to 100K for the cost of manufacturing a single dose of AAV. If someone thinks that's wildly wrong, talk to stat news. Um, they, they interviewed some folks and then, and then gave that number. I think it's just a good reference number, whether it's off by you know, a 2x or I don't know, but it's, it's not cheap at all. Um, and so again, as the optimist, I would say, well, we have, you know, when you look at the beginning of antibody productions, you know, in, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there was the same challenges to make cost-effective antibodies. Um, and, and that was pushed through to, to where we are now. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to say that 
the same efficiencies and, 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 and scale can be met to, to something with AEB. I don't see anything that's inherently so different than, than the, the, the curve that was required for that. So I, I, I think it's a matter of time, but we may find that LNPs or something, some other you know, synthetic particle is a better way to go, and it, it may be ditched over time. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the process of CRISPR and gene editing, as I mentioned, it's just, it, it is inherently more precise. You're, you're fixing the mutation in the right place at the actual gene. So, so that's a win. But we don't get out of the same struggle for delivery. And so a lot of CRISPR companies and approaches are using AV to punch in or some viral construct. To your point, though, um, Cas9, there's two parts to the CRISPR reagents, the guide RNA and then the Cas9 enzyme to make the double-stranded break. The Cas9 enzyme is a pretty big gene, and so that's the bit that doesn't fit well into this 4.4 KB region of the AV. And so companies are having to be creative, maybe using like a shorter version of a Cas9 that would fit, something I've seen some folks doing that. But you, you can package the, the guide RNA into that region. So, it's, you know, I think people are having to get creative with different vectors or, or, or somehow get that Cas9 um, in place. That's, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> all right, well, hey, great talk. Hope this was helpful. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested in talking more, come over and chat with me, and uh, we'll be at the booth for the rest of the week. Cheers. <laughs>